to you all. We usually start these Wednesday night programs with a 35 minute meditation. So we'll do that now. I'll guide us through it for the first 10 or 15 minutes. Can you all hear me okay on Zoom? Yeah, in the room too? Back here. giving our systems time to settle we might remember that there's this body sensitive body Just be curious about how it feels to have a body. Kindly returning to the body in any time the mind moves from it. It's an application of persistent and kind energy. to return to the body linger in the experience of body feeling sensations From gross to subtle. Not trying to change anything. Relaxing. Applying a relaxed and kind awareness. Remembering that every experience belongs. All the pleasant experiences belong.
all the unpleasant experiences belong. All the neutral experiences belong. They belong because they're here. And they're here lawfully. We can keep asking, what does it take to notice with care? To not feed what's unskillful, to acknowledge what's skillful, It's not our capacity to be continuous that matters as much as our willingness to persistently return to the present moment. It's our persistence, kind, relaxed persistence. That supports continuity. And just keep remembering that there's this body and this mind and it feels like this. Belongs this aspect of body, this aspect of mind. It belongs. It's just something being known, not a problem, not personal, not fixed. Let's continue in silence now.
Take a minute to stretch your legs or even look away from your screen for a minute or two, uh, maybe three or four minutes actually. We usually take a bit of a, a break just to uh, replenish ourselves if we need to, get some water. And if you're on Zoom, you wanna say hello to folks in the chat, you can do that. If you're here in the room, feel free to chat it up for a few minutes. So we've been working through this book, A Heart as Wide as the World, and I usually start by reading a chapter, so I'll do that tonight. And then I usually share some reflections connected with the chapter, not always. Not always. Uh, not always teaching through what Sharon taught, but something connected with it anyway. So we're on page 27. If any of you brought your book, some of you usually do. I know. I think I see Patrice grabbing her book on, on Zoom. <laughs> and you don't need it. So if you, and Mary too, yep. Yeah. And if, if you don't have a book, it's totally fine. I'll read it every week and you can listen at that point. So if you'd like to read along, you can it's a quite old book. You can probably, I don't know if you can check it out from the library probably or get it from a bookstore. It's called The Awareness of Breath. I said I'd go back and uh, find this chapter a few weeks ago. The Awareness of Breath. It is said that as a child, the Buddha spontaneously practiced mindfulness of breathing. And on the eve of his enlightenment, he remembered this practice as he searched for perfect balance of mind. Anapana, the Pali word for awareness of the breath, as it enters and leaves the nostrils, is one of the most fundamental objects of concentration that the Buddha taught. When I went to India in 1970, I went specifically to learn how to meditate. By January 1971, I entered my first intensive retreat. I had no experience at all in meditation, but I did have many ideas about what esoteric complex practice I would learn. <laughs> the first meditation instruction I was ever given was to be aware of my breath. The simplicity was shocking. Anapana is a fundamental practice for a number of reasons. The breath is natural and uncontrived. When I first began practicing, I would become anxious about the next breath as though I had to create it. But if I said to myself, you're breathing anyway, you might as well just be aware of it. I could relax. Being aware of the natural breath, we bring forth ease of mind and body. The breath is happening right now in this moment. As we pay attention to the breath, we might find that our attention wanders to the past, comparing the breath that is happening to the present in the present to one that has gone before. Or attention might wander to the future, anticipating when we, might, when we must stand up and eat breakfast and go to work, all while the current breath is still happening. One of the most powerful insights of my early practice came about when I saw how often I was leaning forward, looking for the next breath. I realized that I could simply settle back into the present it's, it felt starting startlingly balanced and completely right, as though I were returning to a natural home that I had been unknowingly missing. With this kind of mindfulness, we noticed both the tendency to fall back into the past and lean forward into the future. And then we can relax and be in balance. In this way, we feel the difference between being scattered and experiencing the wholeness of our full presence. Awareness of the breath serves as a clear mirror not for or against anything, but simply reflecting the moment without the obstruction of concepts and judgments. We can freely let pass whatever arises in the mind as we maintain aware attention on the breath. Perhaps we have a tendency to judge, my breath isn't good enough, deep enough, broad enough, subtle enough, clear enough. I certainly did, as I found the simple act of breathing fraught with projected meaning about what a deficient person I was. 
Returning to the breath as we continually let go of these judgments, we give birth to compassion for ourselves. In this practice of anapana, each breath from the beginning through the middle to the end becomes our universe. Feeling the breath as it enters and leaves the nostrils rather than watching it as if we were distant observers, we become one with the breath, connected with its changing sensations. As I felt the breath, my tendencies to remove myself from the moment and to pull back were challenged and I found an intimacy with my own life. In being mindful of our breathing, we see clearly the fragility of life as we are completely dependent on every intake of air, as we experience the constantly changing sensations that arise and pass away, we begin to watch the solidity of the body dissolve, bringing forth understanding of the nature of change. For life itself is turning on each breath. One of my teachers once said to me, you know, life depends on your breathing in again once you've breathed out. The essence of anapana practice, as of all meditation practices, is the ability to begin again. We may be lost in the past, lost in the future, or lost in judgment. But once we realize we have been distracted, right in that moment, we can begin again and reconnect with the breath. While it might be tempting to spend some time elaborating on our distraction or judging ourselves for not having been with the breath, by letting go and just beginning again, we are at once experiencing a totality of connection and immediate and an and, and immediacy of awareness. In the beginning of my practice, I often lost touch with the breath. When I emerged from my fantasy, I would at times spend the rest of my sitting period chastising myself for having become lost. Why did you do that? Yesterday, you didn't do that quite so much. No one else is getting as distracted, only you. The irony of that experience was that the original fantasy might have distracted me for five minutes, while my getting lost in judgment distracted me for a further 20 minutes and caused even more suffering. As we practice in this way, seeing that no matter what outrageous, difficult, seductive, or foolish thought has arisen, we can begin again. A deep trust in ourselves takes shape. By beginning again, we become present. The Pali word bhavana, usually translated as meditation, literally means causing something to become, calling into existence or bringing forth. It conveys a sense of giving birth. As we practice mindfulness of breath meditation, we are bringing forth ease, presence, intimacy, compassion, wisdom, and trust. Simply by being with our breath, we are giving birth to our wholeness. Pause and take that in, let the land, words land. As with each of these short chapters, they are so powerful to me and so complete. Right from the beginning, although Sharon's talking about mindfulness of breathing, it seems like breathing is not the most important thing. It's all that we learn while watching the breath. And this is what it's like to watch our minds. Any object that we attend to it could be the breath, the Buddha, as far as I understand, really only taught meditation in a couple of places, in the, or at least it's logged in a couple of places in the scriptures. One is when he taught mindfulness of breathing or described mindfulness of breathing. And the second place is in the four foundations of mindfulness. So it could be any experience the breath at the nostrils is one way to practice, but our relationship to any experience, the cultivation of a wise and skillful relationship to experience or a wise and skillful, loving relationship to our life, we might say, right, is really what we're doing. 
that cultivating, it's the object that's less important than the cultivation that's there with the object. Of course, there's an object or an experience. There's the breath, there's a body sensation, there's a thought, there's a sound, there's our patterns to, you know, like Sharon was talking about to judge or condemn or criticize. The purification from the unskillful to the skillful happens right there with the object, but is not the same as the object. I was considering this cultivation that Sharon is pointing to here with this chapter and how cultivation requires some agency on our part, that it can seem counter, finding some agency can seem counter to letting things be as they are. But really, it's a beautiful dance between letting things be as they are, accepting that this experience is just nature and also cultivating the skillfulness of heart and mind that allows us to keep seeing deeply into the nature of experience, to utilize experience, to learn something about our own conditioning or the conditioning of a human being or how experience is conditioned or our relationship to experience. So I was at my house and looking out the window the other day and feeling the freshness of spring and the tiny little, uh, not even buds, but spring growth on the bushes and trees and noticing the places in the garden that my partner Stacy and I worked on last year and the places that we might work on this year that haven't really been tended to before. It's a, we've only lived in this house for a few years. And so it's still the yard, the gardens are still not as, I mean, there's still a work in progress. Let's just say that. <laughs> and how the places that have been tended already in previous years are the soil is not as dense, it's more soft, it's, there's fewer, fewer weeds. Some of the plants that were planted last year, the year prior are sprouting up. We can, there's evidence of that. And in these places that haven't been tended yet, the ground is hard and there's weeds and grass and uh, scrub trees growing up in those areas. And to go out and feel the ground, it feels like something has been tended in the places where something has been tended, right? It's not perfect. The soil is not ready for all life that might grow in that area. And it will need constant tending, persistent tending, right? Over time and throughout the years. But there's something beautiful about the flowers and the plants that are growing as they, you know, the beauty of the, of the growth in soil that has been tended. And what's growing is what we want to grow. And then in these other places where the ground is hard, there hasn't been tending and it's wild. And what's growing there is not what we want to grow. And this is like the mind. When we tend to the mind with persistence, with returning, with a caring, persistent effort, not a demanding effort because that burns out quickly, right? to demand that the earth sprout back what was here last year is not very helpful because who knows what comes back. Some things come back and some things don't. And then every year it seems like there's a new and interesting weed that takes over. You all know that if you're gardeners. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And yet, so it's not perfect. We don't want to hang our hat and I'm going to get this right. But we lovingly keep tending. And so with time, there hopefully what's growing is more of what we want and less of what we don't want. Not without imperfections, of course. Mm -hmm. And the ground that's hard and the areas that haven't been tended to need some stronger effort in the beginning. They might need some shovels and hoes and a little sweat, right? And it might take some years for that ground to be ready to replenish and be fertile and soft like other places in the yard. And that's how it is in the beginning. And it's actually how it is in our minds, the unskillful places of our minds when they don't get, when our minds don't get tended in this way, the unskillful qualities of mind, they sprout and proliferate on their own. That's just what happens. And when our minds get tended with mindful awareness and wisdom, then the unskillful qualities get weaker and there's more of what we want. There's more of what, what we might say, there's more of what's beneficial or what's skillful. So the skillfulness of mind, the skillful qualities of mind, the wholesome qualities of mind, the beneficial qualities of mind, what's useful, right? Those qualities get stronger. And with tending, the unskillful qualities, the defilements, the afflictive mind states, they weaken with persistent tending. Now, if we go for weeks without tending, it's like going, what would happen to our teeth if we went weeks without brushing, right? Our teeth would be furry. <laughs> or something like that, right? And we might have a cavity or we might need some, a, some deeper work there. And that's no real different, not real different than our minds. When our minds go untended, then what we notice is like habits that have gotten strengthened in our lack of awareness, in our lack of tending with the lack of care. Right? We might not practice for a while or forget about the mind. And then we go look like to notice what's going on here. And we're like, oof, it's kind of wild in there. Yeah. But the good news is that there's always the ground can be hoed, right? And we can use a shovel and we can put some work into it. And there's always a possibility of cultivating what's skillful and weakening what's unskillful. So we're never out of luck. So applying our agency is really in service of strengthening the skillful qualities of mind and weakening what's unskillful. Kusala habits and a kusala habits. These are the Pali words, skillful and unskillful. And so if I get there tonight, I'd like to talk about the seven factors of awakening a little bit, but I see that I'm talking a lot about this, but hopefully these uh, little stories or analogies paint a picture for us that we can explore on our own. Like, what does that mean to cult, to tend? What does it mean? Like a, a sculptor would sculpt the mind. We have some, what does that mean? And where is this balance between accepting things as they are, being relaxed and not demeaning ourselves when the mind doesn't stay on the breath? Because we understand this is just a habit. The habit to get lost in thought or the habit to not be aware is just a habit of nature, right? It's no different than the weeds that grow up because there's still roots there somewhere or the qualities of the soil give rise to that. It's no different than that. Yeah. So we don't want to condemn ourselves for that. And these skillful qualities of mind, if we notice them and directly cultivate them and linger, note it, really be willing to notice, oh, these are skillful qualities of mind, then they naturally get stronger. Right? That's just nature. It, that's also nature. Yeah. 
So we accept that this is just nature, whatever this is, the skillful, the unskillful, and we just persist in our tending. Right? So in the four foundations of mindfulness, the fourth foundation of mindfulness is where the, the Buddha talk, taught about this tending that I'm talking about that the mind, that skillful qualities of mind can be tended to, can be directly cultivated. The mind can be shaped, right? It depends on what the mind is fed to how it gets shaped. If what's fed is the unskillful qualities of mind, then it gets shaped by those qualities. If it gets fed skillfulness, then it gets shaped by that skillfulness, right? So even when there's an unskillful quality of mind like doubt or fear or greed, the, the mind that's willing to notice that, feel it and not feed it is skillful, right? It's the mind's tendency to get swept away by that greed, that fear, that doubt is less in those moments because we've felt that right? and we've, the mind and we've, because of our persistent care, there's been a decision to not feed that. Like, I don't want to feed that. I know, I know this mind. I know it's tipping into this place. And I know that I don't want to feed that because this mind gets shaped by whatever it's fed. And in the fourth foundation of, so the first three foundations, the Buddha is like reminding us, just be hands, be hands off get good at knowing the terrain, the human, the terrain of a human being, get good at knowing of connecting with form, with feeling, right. With the mind, just get good at noticing. Don't try to manipulate, but in the fourth foundation of mindfulness, the Buddha is really saying like the mind can be shaped and it's really up to us to do that shaping. It's really up to us right? to remember that we care that this moment matters because whatever it's fed is going to be the inclination of the mind, right? So when we sit down to meditate, I'll just use myself as an example. I sit down to meditate and my mind tips into aversive places. That's, it leans there sometimes. I, you know that. I told you that. <laughs> it leans into these aversive places, but a lot of times in my daily life, I don't, I, I do my best, but I don't notice all the time. And sometimes I'll get caught up in these surly places where I'm complaining to myself or, you know, criticizing or noticing what's wrong. And that will go on for some time before I recognize, oh, this is what's happening. Right. And in that moment, it's good to stop and feel it. I do that. I feel it, feel it in the body, feel the tight shoulders, watch the mind's tendency to pick up those same threads again. Oh, I notice like, oh, that's momentum. The mind has been fed with this unskillfulness. And now it's good at that. It's better at that. And it's going to keep doing that. And so to choose to be more persistent to to uh, care, remember that this moment matters. So to keep noticing that. And so this is kind of a normal thing that plays out in my mind, but we all have our thing, right? And then I sit down to meditate and I go like, I really, I want to cultivate calm and serenity right now. And then what happens? The mind tips into those places once again, right? Complaining, you know, whatever, condemning, complaining, 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 some version of complaining. And I go, ah, oh, mind, I don't want that right now. You know, what I want is calm and can't, am I, am I not better than this? After all these years, mind, haven't we been doing this long enough? And the mind's like, yes, we do this all the time. <laughs> we do this all day. This is what we do. <laughs> and so what, what's happening right now is exactly what's been fed, right? These tendencies, it's expressing its nature. So this, hopefully that paints a little bit of a picture of, yes, we, we have some agency to shape and we also 
cannot get bent out of shape when the mind expresses its habits that have been fed and that have arisen lawfully, right? These uh, seven factors, so the four foundation, the fourth foundation of mindfulness, there are these two teachings in the fourth foundation, the teachings on the five hindrances and the teaching on the seven factors of awakening. And they're like opposite teachings. One is a teaching about recognizing the unskillful habits of mind. And another, the, that's the five hindrances. And then the seven factors of awakening is laying out how insight comes to be, how the mind, how, the, how transformational insight arises. It arises through, not, not uh, by chance, but by the cultivation of these seven factors of awakening. And isn't it true that sometimes it feels like a miracle that the mind has happened upon some skillful place, right? Does it ever feel like, like <laughs> this is just a miracle? It's a, it's a wonderful chance happening here. But it's not at all like that, you know? So we have to use our imagination and have some capacity to believe in ourselves. If I'm gonna, I can, I'm gonna say that. Because it's not like believing that we can get it right all the time, but it's believing that human being, that the mind can be sculpted, right? That the mind can be tended. And when the mind is tended, we're just, trusting that nature will express itself and so that's the believing in ourself it's like oh this mind has the capacity to learn how do i know that because i see other minds are learning you know like even if we don't have that deep faith in our own ability to have insight into the nature of experience deeply into the nature of experience even mildly deep into the nature of <laughs> shallowly into the nature of experience <laughs> But we can, we know people around us that express that, right? Our teachers, some Dharma friends, like they do this. So we can go, oh yeah, it's happening for you. And you're a human being, like I'm a human being. And we know that the, the Buddha taught this, that what's fed about this cultivation thing and what the mind is inclined in uh, the direction of what it gets fed, it's fuel. Right. And so it's just logical. It's just common sense that this mind has some capacity too. And what the Buddha said is that wherever we are in the path, if we're tending it, our minds naturally slope towards freedom. They naturally incline in that direction. So if you're if you're feeling bad about yourself, just remember that. <laughs> I remember this all the time. Like, okay, persistent tending leads to freedom of the deepest kind. Like always slopes in the direction of nibbana, of enlightenment, of awakening, right? Of the deepest kind of freedom we can imagine. The kind of freedom that we, these moments of relief or stress, right? That just are... Uh, the strength of which are bigger than we can imagine. And so this is a quote from the Buddha. Practitioners, just as all the rafters of a peaked house slant, slope, and incline towards the roof peak, so too, when a practitioner develops and cultivates the seven factors of awakening, they slant, slope, and incline towards Nibbana. And how is this so? Here, practitioners, a practitioner develops the awakening factor of mindfulness, which is based upon seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, maturing and release. They develop the awakening factor of equanimity, which is based upon seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, maturing and release. It is in this way that a practitioner develops and cultivates the seven factors of awakening, so that they slant, slope, and incline towards Nibbana. 
for a long time, I avoided this teaching. I would clearly receive it when teachers gave Dharma talks about the seven factors of awakening, but I had some avoidance to actually digging in and understanding it, practicing with it. And when I finally noticed like, well, there's some resistance, what is this? What is this resistance here? The seven factors of awakening. I think it was some deep belief that this isn't for me, right? This awakening is not for me. It's too big, right? I'm just a little hindrance person over here. <laughs> but cultivating the seven factors of awakening seems like for real practitioners. But that's why we need to use our imagination right? and be willing to imagine like a skillful mind. What is a skillful mind? Right? What is that like? And imagine what is what is freedom? What is that like? And in moments when we feel the release of clinging, when we notice that the mind is, is unhindered in moments, like to really let that in, to get a taste of that so that we can imagine that awakening is for us. Not because we think we're all good, but because we contend right? We can all tend. Now, it doesn't mean that tomorrow we suddenly have a mind that abides in skillfulness in ways that blow us out of the water. But it just means that we're willing to persist because it is good. It's always good to persist, no matter how long it takes. I have so much, uh, I feel so grateful that there is something that is trustworthy to place my trust. It's trustworthy. It's a place to abide in faith, especially when things are hard. Like, I don't know what to do. I feel so grateful in moments like that there's a practice to rely on, right? And that there's this, it's so simple. It's about cultivating what's skillful and not feeding what's unskillful. Now my mind might want to chew on all the reasons why I'm justified in fueling what's unskillful, but I actually know something about that, right? That it will only strengthen those habits. Doesn't make it easy, but it is trustworthy, right? This basic truth that the Buddha is teaching us. So the seven factors of awakening, the first one is mindfulness, and it's what balances all seven. So sati, there are three awakening factors that are energizing factors, and three awakening factors that are uh, calming factors. And so the seventh, or the first, is mindfulness, and it, it allows for, because we can Notice when the mind is tipping into places that are too energizing or too tranquilizing, mindfulness can notice that and, and adjust, right? Like we do. So seven, seven factors. The first is sati or mindfulness. The second is investigation. Or, and the third is energy or effort. And the fourth is joy. The fifth is tranquility. And then we have samadhi and equanimity. And in the next 15 minutes, I'm gonna go through this incredibly important teaching that the Buddha offered on his deathbed. Uh, <laughs> so silly but i'm going to give us just an overview of that and just to kind of point that out like this we know this in teaching this teaching was important because in is one of the last things the buddha 
shared with his students before he died, as far as I understand. In a way. And he could have said anything, right? But what he said is to cultivate the seven factors of awakening. So in the four in the four foundations, the Buddha doesn't instruct us to do mindfulness, but in terms of what is mindfulness and how do we practice cultivate this first factor of awakening, he what he encouraged is for us to observe, to understand, to relax, to clearly comprehend, or to review. Right? This is how we cultivate mindfulness by observing the way things are, by understanding the way things are, so wisdom awareness, by relaxing and not manipulating experience, but really relaxing and allowing uh, nature to express itself, right? So that we can understand, clearly comprehend, and then to like review in a way of noticing co what's ca cause effect relationships. Right. So that we know like, okay, when I spend 15 minutes worrying, the effect is that I have a bit of a headache. Oh, unskillful. Or my shoulders are tight or I'm having a hard time really attending to my loved ones. Or when I spend 15 minutes worrying, then the mind is really inclined to worry. Even when I'm in the middle of some activity that is quite joyful, like being with my God kids or something like that, right? So notice the cause effect relationship. And when the mind in contrast, when the mind spends some time uh, lingering in wholesome mind states, life seems to work differently than that, right? When the mind is feeling generous and lingering in gratitude and inclined in that direction, then my relationships tend to work differently. So mindfulness is not some cold experience, but a deep, a deep leaning into presence with life, we might say, right? I was just speaking with a, a community member who got back from a trip to the desert and they were saying that they didn't do a lot of structured practice out there sitting, but they spent so much time in nature and they just came back with a, a renewed spirit, really, like a willingness to be in life and uh, accept their mind. You know, they were just telling me like, oh, what used to bother or prior to the trip, what bothered them about their, their mind's habits, it just didn't feel like it was such a bother. There's just a kind of vitality and yeah. renewed yeah. energy that felt relaxing and peaceful in their system. And it, it felt like, like they had touched some deep presence, right? That is an alignment what the Buddha was talking about when teaching about mindfulness. There's a, a poem that by Louise Erdricht. Let me see if I can. All the advice to myself. She says, leave the dishes, let the celery rot in the bottom drawer of the refrigerator and an earthen scum hardened on the kitchen floor. Leave the black crumbs in the bottom of the toaster. Throw the cracked bowl out and don't patch the cup. Don't patch anything. Don't mend by safety pins. Don't even sew on a button. Let the wind have its way. Then the earth that invades as dust. And then the dead foaming up in gray rolls underneath the couch. Talk to them. Tell them they are welcome. Don't keep all the pieces to the puzzles or the doll's tiny shoes and pairs. Don't worry who uses whose toothbrush or if anything matches at all, except one word to another. Pursue the authentic, decide first what is authentic, then go after it with all your heart, your heart. That place you don't even think of cleaning out, that closet stuffed with savage mementos. Don't sort the paper clips from screws from saved baby teeth 
or worry if we're all eating cereal for dinner again. Don't answer the telephone, ever, or weep over anything at all that breaks. Pink molds will grow within those sealed cartons in the refrigerator. Accept new life, new forms of life, and talk to the dead who drift in through the screened windows, who collect patiently on the tops of food jars and books. Recycle the mail. Don't read it. Don't read anything. Accept what destroys the insulation between yourself and your experience, or what pulls down, or what strikes at, or what shatters this ruse you call necessity. I think this is the kind of mindfulness the Buddha was talking about. In mindfulness and investigation, the second factor of awakening are very closely connected. And it's not the kind of investigation that we might think of. It's not intellectual or conceptual investigation. It's not thinking about our experience and trying to come to a good reason for something or analyzing it like that. For a long time, I taught mindfulness-based stress reduction. I might teach it again. So I don't want to say I don't teach that anymore because I really enjoyed it. And there's a, if you've ever taken MBSR, you probably know that there's uh, in week one, there's an, a raisin exercise in which everybody gets a raisin and spend some time with the raisin, looking at it, being with it investigating it right and then eventually we put the raisin in our mouths and we let the mouth explore the raisin and eventually bite down on the raisin chew and consume the raisin and then talk about our experience with the raisin and there's all kinds of things that people say uh, but the, but you know generally people say well i've never actually eaten a raisin like this before i've never tasted a raisin like this before, right? And sometimes in the beginning, when we start to unpack this exercise, people will say like, "It, it, what did it taste like? It tasted like, and they remember something that it's like, right? Like it tasted like this, or it tasted like, and they remember, I remember tasted like, uh, or I remember eating raisins as, as a kid or something like this, or I remember not liking raisins. And so the mind, how quickly it moves from exploring, really being with an experience to actually thinking about experience and coming up with conceptual justifications or memories or ideas, right? And we, it's so hard to catch this. And in some ways, like words are all concepts, right? But there are some words that get us closer to that felt sense of the experience, like you know, that like it, it had, I could only, I only, I noticed that I was smelling only when I breathed in. I remember when somebody said this, like, yeah, that's, that's what happens, right? It's nice to be able to notice that. Or it, it felt uh, a little rough or smooth, right? Closer to what it, and I could feel that on the hands and it felt warm or it tasted, it had a smoky taste or sweet, you know, what was sweet? I only, I noticed I could taste it, uh, the sweetness left very quickly right? or something like this, but just the willingness to be with an experience in a new way, to lean into any experience that we're having and notice the prickly or the smooth or the heavy, right? or the movement, it's just different. So an in investigation helps us get closer to the nature of experience, to know how it moves, how it's felt, where it's felt. It's deep interest in the actual experience. Is there a capacity of the mind to be here with it? And like I was saying before, investigation is also also includes noticing a cause and effect relationship. You know, the mind that's relating to this, what's that like? And what 
what is the impact or what's the residue? And one of the ways that we know, we can know if we are practicing wise investigation is if the experience is actually energizing. It's energizing in the way that gets us closer to the actual experience of having, of being a human being. So investigation includes understanding that everything is coming and going. And sometimes when we're able to see that, like, oh, this moment I was anxious and now that's somehow no longer here. There's non-anxiety in this moment. Anxiety is not static. Even though it feels like I'm an anxious person, anxiety comes and goes. That's a wonderful thing to notice about experience. Or that wanting, hating the knee pain is different than the unpleasant sensations of knee pain, right? That extra clinging and not like that uh, personal involvement with knee pain is different than this relaxed vibe of allowing physical sensations to be what they are, right? That's a kind of investigation. And this kind of investigation feels, at least in my experience, uh, somewhat enlivening. Yeah, when the mind has some, uh, deepening into human nature and feeling into experience in new ways or deeper ways than we are used to, there is a kind of uplift in the mind. And that uplift is, like, there's an energetic uplift, right? We might call that virya. So if there's that energetic uplift without this kind of exciting, oh, now I'm gonna go off and think about this a whole bunch, right? Then we know we're exploring, we, it's wise investigation. If the mind is just set off into bored with experience or set off onto a conceptual territory or uh, burnt tired from all already thinking, right? Then we know like this perhaps is not wise investigation. So virya is the energy that keeps us going, the fuel. And virya, the fuel that keeps us going, then allows for the simple joy, the simple pleasure of being with experience, which then settles into uh, an interest in and in knowing more subtly what it's like to be a human being, right? That's tranquility. And that settling, then uh, the mind gets interested, more interested in continuity, right? Because it actually feels good. Yeah. And when the mind is more continuous, wisdom awareness is more continuous than wisdom gets stronger, right? And so brings with it both that settledness of the mind, the unification of the mind, but the wise view that everything is workable. Nothing has to be a problem, right? So I think I'll stop here tonight because it's almost nine o'clock and I'll pick up the same topic next week and we'll start with energy then. That sounds like a good good enough plan. Yeah, all right. Okay, so uh, let's just sit for a minute. How about that? Thanks so much for your kind attention tonight, friends. And don't worry, next week I'll give a little overview probably of the seven factors just briefly again. So uh, you don't have to remember everything you heard. You can just let it go.
and then we'll pick it up and continue the exploration. Okay. All right. Take good care. See you again.